Hey guys, so today we're going to talk a little bit more about the gates that were revealed in uh, the video that we saw yesterday. I know that we've seen the flyover of Ulthuan and we've seen some of these gates, but we didn't really kind of know exactly how they'd play out. So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit a bit more about those. So Ulthuan is protected from the north by these grand fortresses built by Caldor the Conqueror. Calador is the second Phoenix King, and the father to Calador II, we hear of uh, during the War of the Beard. Sometimes Phoenix Kings take up names just like monarchs of our history, so Calador's name is actually Imric, that's how he was born. And that's not to be confused with uh, the Imric in the current High Elf Lord roster of uh, 8th, 7th, 6th, and 5th edition, so on and so forth. But Calador gives... Uh, birth. Well, no, he doesn't give the birth. Holy God! Uh, but Caldor has two sons, Caldor the Second and Imaldric, and we find out that Imaldric also dies during the War of the Beard. But really, what he's what held together Ulthuan during the Sundering. He's this this courageous leader that leads the High Elves through many battles of that time, and he constructed the many gates, uh, or better, you know, fortresses that dot the northern landscape of Ulthuan. And these gates hold their, their, really their dark brethren at bay. And Caldor has a very sort of epic and sad end, kind of kind of tragic at the same time. He, he's already heralded as this amazing king in the eyes of the High Elves. You know, he gets he gets to the Blighted Isle, the same place that Anarian pulls a sort of cane. He, he approaches the blade and is tempted by it and simply just says, no. And Caldor, at this time, again, he, he's leading all these raids. He's, he's taking... Uh, the Blighted Isles, it's changed hands a number of times. So he is, again, very heralded with, with the High Elves. They needed this guy to kind of be their 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 rock, their bastion. So Caldor leads these, these raids, and the same one that he actually captures the Blighted Isle and, and says no to the sort of cane, uh, he, or a curb, the, the, the sort of cane, as you could say, is the same one he gets separated from the main High Elf fleet by a freak storm. And the armor books really talk about how it's him fighting for hours on end trying to fend off the Dark Elves that fall upon his ship. And in the end, they get the upper hand, the Dark Elves, and rather than giving himself over to the Witch King, a victory that, again, the High Elves really couldn't afford so early in this this game, in this, this sundering and post-sundering world, because the Dark Elves have retreated to Nagaroth at this time, and the High Elves can afford to lose again so quickly. So he jumps into the sea, armor on and all. And the book outright says that this is a bad end to a great king. So we're going to talk about the many great gates created by Kalidor after seeing that first video that came out on Friday about the Eagle Gate. So these gates are all set in the mountains, barring the outer kingdoms from the inner kingdoms, should any of them uh, fall to the Dark Elves. But they're also positioned at the pathways that lead to the inner kingdoms directly, presenting choke points to defend against. So... It's a really great tactical advantage to have these because they the only way into those inner kingdoms uh, outside of outright scaling mountains is these pathways, is these gates. So there are five gates we'll be talking about. Griffin, Eagle, Unicorn, Phoenix, and finally the Dragon Gate. So let's get started. And, and we'll, we'll go in sort of a loose chronological order as we don't really know the exact order of the construction of these gates. But what we do know is that the Griffin Gate is indeed the oldest of the five great gates of Ulthuan. It is located in the westernmost mountains, I'm sorry, not the westernmost, but in the western mountains of Ulthuan, on the westernmost edge of Illyrian. Uh, most of these gates border Illyrian for the most part, with the Eagle Gate being a, a slight exception we'll get into soon. But Illyrian is the first inner kingdom opposite Nagarith. So it has been attacked the most of any inner kingdom, and with, I believe, Trace and Nagarith sharing the honor of on the outer kingdom side of things. Uh, Trace being... Obviously, the, the first uh, the first target in Nagarth being the first target, especially with An with uh, the old fortress of Anlek right there. So, furthermore, the Griffin Gate has seen the most sieges of any of the Great Gates of Old One, having been beset by attackers hundreds of times in the past uh, couple thousands of years. It's even considered a, a more or less an unlucky gate to serve at. And but the real gem of the gate is the is the beautiful view that presents itself every morning, <laughs> as you as you really kind of look out over the ramparts, as you look out across the the fields of Illyrian and, and the swept up lands of Calador and across the uh, the sea of dusk. You can see Ulthuan in the same kind of gleaming gold light that the that the High Elves at the Empire's height must have had, and not Empire 
for the old one, but the High Elves Empire. And unique to the Griffin Gate is the uh, the Garrison of Shadow Warriors, and they they their ability to kind of sight the lions for the Equal Claw Bolt Throwers uh, makes them extremely accurate. And really, no other gate has a unit of Shadow Warriors, as they spend a lot of their time kind of prowling the lands of Nagarith, uh, looking for Hood Rats and, and Dark Elves um, to assail and hit and hit and run tactics for both of those things. Uh, but needless to say, the Griffin Gate has yet to really fall to any besiegers. And what I'm wondering here with Total War Warhammer 2 is, will we see some unique mechanics with that? With Obviously, we're not going to see Shadow Warriors in the game just yet, but maybe each one of these gates will have some unit benefit uh, as as uh, befitting that gate's lore. So, clearly no Shadow Warriors, obviously, but maybe possibly some veteran bolt throwers, or maybe bolt throwers with higher accuracy or higher fire rate, or maybe they're better at anti-infantry. So, Maybe something that, that gives them a bonus uh, per gate or, or some sort of thing that kind of gives a nod to the lore. Because the Griffin, all the gates don't go into a ton of detail in the actual High Elf Army book. They go into a lot of detail in the the Uniforms and Heraldry book that uh, I bought and I love. Because it basically gives you a lot of different ways to paint High Elves. And you're going to see a lot of pictures throughout this video about, or I'm sorry, uh, of the, from that book. So you, so you see exactly what these uh, individual gates heraldry look like. Some of them brought the uniforms of their respective realms that they came from, but some of them have specific uniforms specific to that gate. There, there's always some sort of banner or some sort of iconography that befits the gate that they're protecting. We'll uh, actually then just kind of move on to the next one at this point with the Eagle Gate. And that's just, this is the gate that is now most familiar with everyone probably after seeing the newest first look video and we'll get some footage of that in here so we can really drive home the location and grandeur of this place and i'm i'm very very excited for these gates i think they're going to be really awesome looking but it's positioned at the mountain pass connecting nagarith in the south of nagarith to the rest of the inner kingdom it's the absolute westernmost gate in between both illyrian and calador on the inside and tiranach and nagarith on the outside um, as we can see here, it is the leftmost, westernmost gate here. But since these gates are attacked so frequently, they are manned by a constant garrison. And we've we've heard of this from the actual roster list. We know that there is going to be garrison-specific units for these gates that never can leave the gate. And there is really no simple garrison that there to hold the gate, like I was saying. They're fully manned by an elven host, really ready to repel any attackers at a moment's notice. And as such, it's one of the places in Ulthuan that maybe an aspiring noble or a warrior can really see a lot of constant action. And this kind of helps to bring them up the ranks of either uh, the military or the tumultuous elven nobility, as we hear so much about from the mechanics that are soon, soon to be released in Total War Warhammer 2 with the High Elves. And this does come at a price, though, as the, the gates, as I was saying, are under constant siege, you know, constant action and whatnot, by Dark Elves and also beasts out of the Anuli Mountains. Which is something to really note here, you know. You might not be dealing with a horde of Dark Elves from the mountains, but a few wild, monstrous creatures are going to mess up anyone's day. But maybe here with the Eagle Gate, since it is con under constant siege, we'll maybe see more veteran units here, something like that. Or maybe they have more veteran infantry or something to kind of give a nod to the fact that the Eagle Gate is under attack almost the most of any of these gates. But that's something to consider as, as a possible mechanic for the Eagle Gate. The Unicorn Gate, though, on the other hand, is placed a bit differently than the other gates. For one, it's right in the middle of the five gates, with the Eagle and Griffin to the left, phoenix and dragon to the right and the biggest feature of the unicorn gate is not necessarily the gate itself but the mountain pass it protects so as you can see from the map here it's in the middle of the longest stretch of mountain running from nagarith to illyrian meaning that this trail is both long and treacherous and this has led to the unicorn gate being the least assailed really assaulted of of any of the great gates for it's naturally protected by wailing calls of cockatrices and the horrid shrieks of harpies haunting the ravines, passes, and mountaintops. So as a result, the Unicorn Gate, rather than defending against Dark Elves, fights off a lot of the many beasts that so naturally stalk its pathways and foothills. So this allows for more a, a more elite archer garrison with plenty of target practice in the local beasts that prowl the outskirts of the fortress. 
And for these beasts to get close would, you know, ultimately spell some doom. So that's why the archers are going to be plucking at them nonstop. So maybe this means there's going to be a higher archer density at the unicorn gate. Or maybe better archers via veteran status. Or perhaps even they'll have a benefit or bonus to fighting against beasts. In the off chance that the Dark Elf hosts bring us a lot of beasts. Cold ones, hydras, harpies. Or some beastmen that are all roving around that do maybe go to Ulthwan. It gives a bonus to fighting beastmen. So there's plenty of plenty of ways to add a lot of flavor to these gates to make them rather than just strong points in the high elf realm to actually giving them perks to to the gates themselves. So making it so it's a little bit scarier to besiege them. But the defenders of the unicorn gate are are primarily drawn from Illyrian and that sharing in the same kind of heraldry of that land as well as training the very archers that we that we've just talked about that come from the ranks of the reavers already exceptional bowmen as it is so some gates though do not fare as unscathed as the griffin or unicorn gates like the other three which have weathered the storm without much of an issue the phoenix gate is named quite appropriately, as befitting its long and torrid history. Uh, this is the only gate to really have fallen and been rebuilt multiple times, much like the flames of the phoenix being reborn from its ashes. And part of the saying of the High Elves is that, uh, it kind of to kind of say like, if these walls are toppled, then we shall simply build them higher and grander than before. And that's really the crux of the phoenix gate, right? And that's elfdom in, 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 a, in a nutshell too. The gate's walls are said to really sort of extend above the clouds of the Anuli Mountains, which you can imagine is pretty damn high. And as a result, not many elves are really quick to uh, spend some time at that fortress that's destined to fall once again. So, I mean, I couldn't even imagine waylaying a wall that damn high, and I assume they're factoring in the height of the mountain itself, in addition to the gate already being tall. So, you know, fancy imagery of elves and whatnot. But the Phoenix Gate... Uh, as befitting its name, draws a lot of its warriors then from Iatane, the home of the Phoenix King, and thus the great Phoenix Shrine with the Phoenix Guard. <laughs> but from there, the fortress is really ever populated with some of the best and afforded all expenses when it comes to uh, provisioning bolt, pro proper bolt thrower emplacements, um, fitted with some of the best bolt throwers in the land, actually. So the archers as well, they, they hail from typically Kalidor or Avalorn, you know, decked out in the reds of Kalidor, the greens of Avalorn, and they carry the blessing of Assyrian upon their arrows to kind of give them a little bit of a oomph. But so, uh, again, a, a gate that has been destroyed, but by no means diminished in its grandeur as the stubbornness of elves simply says, okay, uh, higher? Yeah, cool. But maybe with the Phoenix Gate, we'll see another mechanic pertaining to uh, eagle claw bolt throwers either in quantity amount or something of the sort and maybe if if you have these as a high elf faction if you if you get these gates because it, you clearly don't start with the gates if you're looking at the map you start with eatane which is not the gates themselves and maybe as you get them some, through some sort of diplomacy it may be okay maybe the phoenix gate lowers your overall cost of upkeep for the Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower. Maybe there's some mechanic they're going to add like that. That wouldn't be too crazy and too game-breaking, but I think it'd be pretty cool and flavorful for the Phoenix Gate. But uh, last, but by no means the least of the great gates of Ulthuan is the Great Dragon Gate. And this gate falls between the Phoenix and the Unicorn Gate and is pretty important in the grand scheme of things in my mind. So with the constant war, raids, and other misdeeds of the Druchi, Druki, Drugi, whatever you want to call them, uh, Kalidor the Conqueror effectively turned the Dragon Gate into his war capital. I mean, there's no real reason for him to stay in Lothurn down in Neotane if he's constantly having to fight against these massive hosts of Dark Elves coming in from Nagarith. Thus, this is the largest and really the most grandiose of all all of the gates of Ulthuan. Uh, parapets decked with effigies of dragons, uh, banners from all over the nation adorned with the snarling grimace of the fiery lizards themselves, draped and flapped in the breeze across the grand landscape that is the Dragon Gate. But uh, a palace was actually set into the wall, the fortress walls itself, giving a, c a court for Kalidor to rule from, as well as many estates crafted in the walls as well, being created for visiting nobles, looking to treat with the second Phoenix King, stuff like that. So the real draw here, though, was the military might of the Dragon Gate. Kalidor was 
no fool. He, he wasn't stupid. You know, he knew that the Dark Elves were a bloodthirsty lot, are willing to really test their martial ability, read arrogance, against uh, the most threatening of targets. I mean, anything. They'll, they'll throw it all to the wind as long as it's for Kane. But the garrison was huge. The books say that the garrison is twice the size of two of the largest gates put together, making for a gigantic glittering host of high elves. That's what it's called in the books is the glittering host. But as a result, six whole dark elf armies besiege the dragon gate over time, each one breaking upon the walls as water on rock, just like the rest. And part of the tragedy of the elves, and I mean, we're talking about all this, this their history here, it's so rich and vibrant and full of martial, arcane and majestic epicness, and the other side of that coin, and again, being the tragedy, is the state of things now. The Dragon Gate's garrison is now a shadow of its former self, with much of the elves of this world having died in the many conflicts up to this point. You know, We've talked about the Sundering having been before this, that point of the, of the gate creation, or we've talked about the demon incursions, we've talked about the War of the Beard, so this has really drained the elf nation. And it, it is by no means any less defended than any other gate, but... Time has really taken its toll on not just the Dragon Gate, but Ulthwan as a whole. And it should really come at no surprise that the Dragon Gate is garrisoned by a predominantly Caledorian based army, with their noble dragon princes kind of awaiting the next opponent to uh, sally forth from the gates and deal out the creator's fury uh, toward. And the creator is Asurian, the, the, the main god that the High Elves worship, Cain being the one the Dark Elves worship, and uh, Kyrnos being the one the Wood Elves predominantly worship. There's obviously the whole elf pantheon of, uh, I believe it's like, there, I think it's like 20 or 12 gods. I can't remember off the top of my head, but we'll go into that in the in the next big lore video coming up here. I'm going to divide it into the two, basically the ones that live in heaven, basically the ones that live in hell, more or less. Um, but what would I would see this as a, as a mechanic standpoint is maybe we'll see some benefits to dragon princes or maybe dragon princes, dragon, dragon princes can be recruited with um, a higher rank just like some of the other some other buildings we've seen in the game. So okay, you you own the dragon gate now you get a plus two veteran rank on all your dragon princes you recruit. Or maybe again it reduces their overall upkeep or again maybe just a veteran unit of dragon uh, princes control the dragon gate or. As I'm saying this, my brain's riffing off a million to possible things, but maybe you get access to a regiments of renown dragon, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, dragon prince from controlling the dragon gate. So there's a lot of ways they can really make these gates very, very flavorful and very lore oriented by just simply kind of going with what's really just already written in the books. But uh, that that does really sum up the great gates of Ulthwan and the grand fortresses that have stood sentinel over the northern entryways into the Ulthwan for centuries. You know, they're, they're, preventing beasts and dark elf alike from gaining any real purchase in the land of the high elves. And what will this mean for Total War Warhammer 2? Will we have specific siege mechanics or requirements met to even get there? You know, will there be heavy attrition leading up to the gates? Like maybe you're trying to besiege the unicorn gate and it's attrition all the way up to the front of the gate. Uh, maybe some gates are easier to get to, so less attrition if we're going off the attrition mechanic, but more defenders. So the Griffin, or I'm sorry, the Eagle Gate, which we've already seen, is pretty much like smack dab right there on the seawall. Maybe that's got no attrition, you walk right up to it, but there's a shit ton more defenders. But maybe the defenders will benefit from these lore characteristics. Who's really to say? This is a lot of speculation, but I, for one, am very excited to play as the High Elves and defend these gates. So, or as well as the uh, Dark Elves to besiege these gates. Um, I'll be doing all that on launch day as I stream both the High Elf and the Dark Elf campaigns to just get a get a real good feel for things. But this is just a few weeks away, a few precious weeks that couldn't come any quicker. But uh, that kind of concludes the, the Great Gates of Ulthwan here today, guys. If you have any questions or anything that you know from the lore from maybe previous editions or stuff that I left out, please feel free to comment. I um, always love to hear your feedback on these things. But uh, thanks for watching. Have a good one and take care.